And amen. Welcome to Living Water. How's everybody doing? It's so great to have you here to, to just celebrate with Chaplain Fowler and his new bride, Saul. And uh, this morning, as I prayed about the message, we were going to get into all the laws in Leviticus. Don't you love those laws in Leviticus? Some of you are like, what are, what are you talking about? But God changed my mind, and we're going to talk about real quickly God's design for marriage. You know, I believe that the enemy truly loves to split apart marriages, to break apart homes. And the family, folks, believe it or not, is the foundation for a good society and a great society. I believe marriage is very important. And when you do it right by God's design, man, you're blessed. You have the joy of the Lord. You have a loving relationship that lasts a lifetime. It's been said that marriage is a three-ring circus. You ever hear that? You know, it starts with the engagement ring, it moves on to the wedding ring, and then finally comes the suffer ring. And then ultimately, with many marriages, it ends with divorce-ing. It's a lot of ings. Folks, I don't believe that's God's design for marriage. I don't believe that's optimal, and I know for a fact that God has something better. It shouldn't be the case, but man left to himself, I got to tell you, is typically selfish, narcissistic, self-willed, self-motivated, completely self-promoting. All they do is for their own good. They do their own thing. They don't think about anybody else. But in marriage, if you want it to be successful, you always have to care about your spouse more than anyone else. You know, a lot of marriages fail because they really don't know what love is. The Bible says very clearly that God is love. You see, when you know God, all of a sudden he pours into you this love that flows out of you, the Bible says, like living water, streams of living water. Marriage is God's design for men and women to be complete and to build a family. The Christian marriage is really a visible expression of the relationship that Christ has for the church, and that's why I believe marriages are so under attack. I believe this morning God would have us evaluate where we are with our marriage. If you're single, to pray for your future spouse or the gift of celibacy. Uh, what, which one are you praying for, Scott? I mean, you're up here, so I'm going to pick on you. Celibacy, well, never mind. We need to pray that, that God gives Scott a really good spouse, right? For many of you, Pat Benatar hit the nail on the head in your marriage. I got to tell you, love can be what? Yeah, a big old battlefield. You know, you engage the enemy every day when you come home from work. And as you're sitting in your car, it's like, okay, we need to get ready to engage. What's my strategy going to be? All you military guys, you probably know more than I do about what we're talking about. Uh, however, I really believe that it shouldn't be thus, but ultimately it'll end like that. Yeah, this woman was quite angry with her husband. Uh, all I know is, you know, I've heard of people driving by homes when they're arguing and about to divorce, and there's a Mercedes, brand new Mercedes, or a really nice car in the parking lot, and this lady puts a sign up there, five bucks, or the highest bidder, and sells her husband's car. You ever hear about that? Yeah, it's pretty good. God's design for marriage. It is God's plan that the husband and wife would be in complete unity. I believe that marriage is a partnership. You're no longer two individuals, but you come together as one in love and in unity, and you work together to handle the challenges of life. But so many people, they maintain their personhood. They maintain their individuality. Marriage, I believe, is a sacred union. In fact, it is God who joins a man and woman together in holy matrimony. It is not an institution by state. It can't be politicized. It can't be adjudicated. It is God's institution. And it is only God that can define marriage. God's design for marriage, I believe, is simple. God created man in his own image. 
the imago Deo, if you happen to be a theologian. The image of God is created in us, and he created them male and female. Do you know what? When he created Adam and Eve in the garden, they were complete partners. Oh, they were completely equal. All things were good. What happened? Eve got that apple. You know, they had one rule, one law. Just don't eat from that tree. That tree in the corner right there, there's fruit on there. Don't eat from that. It'll make you sick. Well, God told Adam and Eve, don't eat from that tree. What it, what they do, they ate from it. And because of that, the curse, guess what? Men, you're going to have to work by the sweat of your brow. Women, you're going to have pain in childbirth. Women, guess what? Also, I created you equal partners. Now man is going to be the head of the household because of the sin in the garden. And that still applies. Now, one day it won't be so, but that's how it was. God saw that before he created Eve that Adam was alone. Now, he knew he was going to create Eve. But he said, man, I need to make him a life partner. And since the beginning of time, man was to leave his father and mother, cleave to his wife, and the two become one flesh. Amen. Completely unified in the Holy Spirit. When Jesus asked about divorce, or when they asked Jesus about divorce in Matthew chapter 19, you know this phrase, the quote is up there. He said, what God has joined together, what? Let no man separate. You see, marriage is not just a piece of paper that says now you're legally married. It's not just a ceremony that you go through the motions and say, I do. God supernaturally joins a man and a woman together and they become one. It should be the most beautiful, the most sacred, the most holy, the most guarded thing in your life. Folks, you need to guard your marriage. God's definition of marriage, God has clearly defined that marriage should really last a lifetime. It is not meant to end in divorce. Marriage is supposed to be where you build a family and your kids and your grandkids all can come to your house and say, Grandma and Grandpa, man, I have this solid rock, this sanctuary that I know whatever happens in the world, my family is there. You see, family is a cornerstone of any great nation. The Roman Empire, actually, it's been theorized that it fell because divorce rose to such extents that the foundation, the pillars of society, the family, broke apart and the nation could not stand. I fear for our nation. It should be between one man and one woman. Marriage is, has the whole idea of building a family and procreating. That's what it's intended to do. It's patterned after the relationship of Christ and the church. Marriage is a lifetime covenant and all the way up until the 1960s. Maybe some of you can remember this. I remember when I was young, if someone got a divorce, the whole town talked about it. Oh, my. Oh, they, I, I mean, divorce was rare. People knew marriage was important and families stayed together. But in 1970, a decree went out that now marriage, you can divorce for no fault. And usually it's, what, irreconcilable differences. I don't really know what that means. It's, you, you know, I, I have irreconcilable differences with everybody. You know, <laughs> shave your beard, cut your hair, lose some weight, you know, what, whatever. Dude, if I live my life with that, theology or that ideology I think I'd be a monk in a cave somewhere well come to think of it I did live on a sailboat by myself with no home port for two years that thus the beard you know it's just the salty dog thing in me it is becoming increasingly more po popular to vow in a marriage ceremony as long as our love shall last have you have you been to a wedding where they did that instead of it till death do us part well, as long as our love shall last, man, we'll stay married. And then they become disillusioned. And their whole idea of love is not really the love of the Bible that's patient, kind, good, gentle, forgiving, doesn't take into an account a wrong suffered. But their idea of love is really in the Greek eros, and it's that physical lust. It's not real love. It is something else. And when that leaves, they think the marriage is over and there's no love left. Folks, I got to tell you, God is in the business. By the way, he created that. 
to be enjoyed in the mar mar marriage bed, Amen. to be undefiled. God's plan for you is to be married for life, not as long as you feel like it. God, this morning, I want to tell you this, you married folks can heal your marriage. And we all struggle. I mean, if you haven't got to a knockdown, drag out World War III fight with your spouse and thought at least, man, whew, okay, you know, that's it. I'm leaving. <laughs> if we do it his way. And what is his way? God's design for marriage, really quick, we're, this is going to be a short sermon, is to celebrate life together. It should be. Now, it takes work. Don't get me wrong. But in the midst of the work, you've got to celebrate life together. I preached a short sermon once, Balloons Belong in Church. Any of you hear that sermon? I don't think so. Maybe. Did you, Donna? Yeah, I bet. Ross, yeah, okay. And, and Ross, thanks for putting up these balloons. And uh, Mark, thanks for bringing the balloons. And Because I believe real Christians should be the most celebrant, happy, joy-filled people on the planet. And why is that? We have the fruit of the Spirit that wells up within us. It's from God, you know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, all of that good stuff. But we know where we're going when we die. I got to tell you, as believers, if we get diagnosed with cancer, we don't fear. The, the cool thing about knowing God and embracing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior is this. You don't fear anything. I love Stonewall Jackson. I, I know this isn't political correct, but this one quote he said. He said, I don't fear death just like I don't fear going to bed. Why? Because I know the Lord Jesus Christ. When I die, I just go home to be with him. I don't fear anything, not even death. That's the beauty of being a child of God. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verses 7 through 9, it's up there. It says, go then, eat your bread in happiness and drink your wine with a cheerful heart for God has already approved your works. Let your clothes be white all the time. Isn't it funny, most of the time we only wear white at weddings. Of course, Chris has black on, we know why. Uh, his bride will have white on. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Oh, man. Yeah. Let your clothes be white and let your oil not lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the woman whom you love all the days of your life. And that, that idea in the Hebrew is your, your wife. Hey, enjoy life with your wife all the days of your fleeting life. Well, that's encouraging. Which he has given you under the sun. For this is your reward in life and in your toil in which you have labored under the sun. There's a story about a great businessman in Wall Street. He would visit this little village in Mexico every year to do some fishing. Little fishing village. You ever hear the story? Okay. Well, every year he would go there and he would talk to the guy about one day I'm going to retire and I might retire in Mexico and maybe in a little village like this. And he was telling him his great plans and that's why he works 80 hour weeks in Wall Street and he ignores his family and he's been divorced three times and he's telling this, this fisherman from this little village in Mexico his one day goal. Fisherman's out there thinking, he goes, so let me get this right. One day after working and being divorced because you're so married to your work and ignoring your family and being lonely and your kids won't talk to you now and all you have to look forward to is coming here once a year, one day your goal in life is to live like I do. You see, so many things we put before God and before our marriage and before our family. Folks, it really ought to be God, our spouse, our children, our family, our church family, our family in the military or, or whatever organization you're a part of. All of those things are important, vastly more important than how much money you make or prestige in life. Here, the, the uh, Solomon wrote, said to be the most wisest man in the world. Hey, man, as long as you have bread on your table, you have wine to enjoy with your wife, man, that's all there is. That's the most important thing in life. Breaking bread with family. It, 
Now, I, I got to tell you, it, Pastor Chris just said close her option. <laughs> well, and uh, if I start turning red, you know, just uh, actually he stole my thunder because during the ceremony coming up, I've got one verse about the honeymoon, and, and it is about being naked. I'm just saying. It's in the Bible, so we'll get there. The first miracle that Jesus Christ performed is important, and he did it at a wedding. And you know what he did? He turned water into wine. Do you think God cares about weddings and marriages? Do you think he cares about the joy that he wants you to have? Turn, if you would, if you have your Bibles. If not, I'm going to read it. It's John chapter 2, starting at verse 1. I keep forgetting I'm old. I... I'm, I'm a young man in an old man's body, and uh, I need these things now. It just, you know, it's like, okay, wow. oh, better. Wow. And, whoa, my goodness, my screen just got HD. Before that, it was all muffled. And All right, John chapter 2, starting at verse 1. And we're going to do this quickly. Don't worry, I'm just going to preach till about 1 o'clock. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Uh, on the third day it was a wedding in Canaan of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. And his mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six stone water pots set forth for the Jewish custom of purification, containing 20 to 30 gallons each. I want you to picture that. Those are big pots. 20 to 30 gallons of water each. Verse 7. And Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him, and when the head waiter tasted the water which had become wine and did not know where it had come from, but the servants who drew the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom. And he said, Every man serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poorer wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. And this was the beginning of his signs that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, and he manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. The very first miracle Christ did was at a wedding. And it wasn't turning water into tea or water into coffee. It was water into real wine. Do you think God wants us to celebrate life? I really believe so. God cares about your marriages. Jesus, his first act once we're in heaven. You see, we believe in what's called the rapture, where Christ is going to come back and we're going to go home up to heaven to the marriage supper of the Lamb. They call it. Guess what it is? It's a wedding. He started his ministry with a wedding, and the church age will end at a wedding. In fact, Christ said in Matthew 26, 29, I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Isn't that amazing? That we're going to go to a marriage supper? Revelation 19.9 is all about that marriage supper. And it says, Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who were invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. And if you read that in context, man, it's a call to the church. And she's clothed in white. And guess what those white robes are? The righteous acts of the saints. And it's interesting that righteousness in the Bible, some of you older guys, you remember cars in the 50s were righteous, you know, but, but that's not it. You know, righteousness in the Bible is love and faith. That's it. It's not how good you are. It's not like, well, you know, I go to church, I don't cuss, I don't chew, I don't drink, I don't go with girls who do. Oh, you know, that'd be kind of gross, girls chewing tobacco anyway, but... It's, it's not about that. Our righteousness, the Bible says, is imputed to us through what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. Meaning, no matter how wretched you are, and believe me, look in a mirror, I look in a mirror, we all are desperately wicked. 
in need of someone to save us and restore us and heal our marriages because left alone, oh, there, there went the PowerPoint. <laughs> left alone, guess what? Man, we are wretched and miserable and poor. The importance of marriage is this. The first institution, hey, it came back. The first institution that God established in Genesis, guess what? It was the marriage. A man will leave his father, cleave to his wife, the two will become one flesh. The first miracle was at a wedding. Water into wine. The first thing we'll do in heaven at the end of the church age is celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb. Marriage is definitely important to God. God gives us instructions on how to have a blessed marriage. We're going to read some verses, and then we're going to take a little break, and then we're going to do the ceremony. Isn't that great? But these are important. First Peter chapter 3, it says, You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker, and we all know that, since she is a woman. <laughs> what does that mean? Women, it, it means you're, you're not as smart, and you're not as... No, no, it doesn't mean that. That word in the Greek really has the idea of vases that are very delicate and valuable. The idea is, hey, you husbands live in the same way with your wives in an understanding way as with someone more delicate and more valuable than you. Are you with me? Men, your wife is precious. And when you speak harsh words to your wife, it breaks her, and just like a delicate boss, it will take you time to put that back together. Difference is, you, you women, you can call us names, hit us, whatever, but, you know, five minutes later, we're good, you know, <laughs> for the most part. Delicate. Notice this. Since she is a woman, and show her what? Honor. honor. Men, honor your wives. Wives, honor your husbands. Honor each other. To esteem more highly than you as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. He goes on to say to sum up, all of you be harmonious. Dude, women, men, dudes, dudettes, be harmonious. Stop the fighting. Stop the pattern of fighting in your marriages. When you start going there, just say, man, I love you. I love you, even though you want to cuss them out in your mind. Don't do it. I love you. Be harmonious. Be sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, humble in spirit, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for this very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. Love one another. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 13, it says, so as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved. Hey, it skipped ahead. Wow, hold on. I had it memorized. <laughs> there we go. Holy and beloved, put on a heart of what? Compassion for each other. Kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. <laughs> hey, yeah, yeah, steadfast perseverance in the midst of technical glitches. Bearing with one another, forgiving each other, whoever is complaining against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you. I, I got to tell you, folks, you got to really forgive your spouse. They will hurt you. Make no mistake about it. They will say stupid things. You need to forgive them and put on a heart of compassion. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word that is good for edification. That means to build up. So men, we need to build up our wives. Wives, you need to build up your husbands according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness... Man, if you have a bitter root against your spouse, you got to get that healed in your heart. And wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away with you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Husbands, love your wives, just like Christ loved the church. Wives, honor and submit to your husband. We all make mistakes. We all fail to be good husbands or a good wife. Every mistake you've made, I want you to know, 
that Jesus Christ paid for that on the cross. And with his shed blood, he took upon himself your sin. And I don't care how grievous your sin was. The Bible is filled with men that did horrible things. Like David, who committed adultery with Bathsheba and then sent her husband to the front lines of the battle so that he would die so that he could marry his wife. That's pretty bad, yet God forgave him. And in fact, since David repented, he said, he's a man after my own heart. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says, but God demonstrates his own love toward us that while we are yet sinners, and that's, guess what, all of us in this room, Christ died for us. This morning, you can renew your vows, you can renew your marriage, you can restore that rift between you and your spouse and that rift between you and God. He wants to forgive you of everything. John 14, 26, 7, Christ said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, and do not be fearful. As Christians, we don't fear anything but God. You've got to have the fear of God. But you don't fear anything else. Not battle, not anything else. Except when your wife says, could you wash the windows for me? I fear that. I hate that. No. All the cares of life he wants to take. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus says this. Come to me, all who are weary. All who are battle weary. Who are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Because it's a whole bunch of rules that religions and churches pass down. No, 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 no. Only rule book we have is this. And guess what? It's not burdensome. It's all summed up in what? Love God? Love your neighbor as yourself. Men, love your wife as I love you. Wives, love your husbands. Oh, and he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Today is the day for a fresh start. Folks, if you love God, number one in your life, he is going to go before you and strengthen you. And any challenge you face in life, he's going to provide air support for you. I need that. I need that. You know, we've got our our battle line communicators with us. It's prayer. And when you pray, God hears your prayers. Well, you don't know how sinful I am. Hey, I don't care. Christ paid for that. If you believe that, you're cleansed. You're forgiven. Number two, love your spouse. If you have your priorities of life right, this is God's design. If you love him first, you love your spouse second, you love your children and your family next, and then those that God has blessed you with in your life, in whatever realm of influence or uh, sphere that you walk in. Some of you, though, may be thinking it's too late for me. I just want to go over a few things. When we say, I can't go on, and you fill in the blank, with my marriage, with my job, with my faith. I just can't go on. I've come to the end of myself. Jesus says, looking to them, Jesus said to them, with people, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. He can save your marriage. He can help give you the strength to go on. When we say, you don't know my circumstances, pastor, in Philippians we read, not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I'm in. I know how to get along with humble means, and I know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. Oh, what's the secret? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If you've lived life, you have faced great challenges. If you have not faced any challenges in your life, wow, man, don't worry, you will. They say getting old is not for wimps, right? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see, God created us to have relationship with him. And the minute you run to him, man, I tell you what, he will never leave you alone. 
Because we say, man, I'm lonely. And Jesus says in Hebrews chapter 13, make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. God says in Isaiah, do not fear. I am with you. Do not anxiously look about. For I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will surely help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. How many of you say, how am I going to pay my bills? Man, the promise is in Matthew chapter 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all your needs will be met. I got to tell you this, folks, when you're depressed and down, this morning God says, I'll restore your joy. Isaiah chapter 35, the ransomed of the Lord will return and come a singing unto Zion with everlasting joy. Man, it's going to be upon their heads and they will find gladness and joy and sorrow and sign will flee from them. The Lord says, I'll turn your ashes to beauty. In Jeremiah 31, it says, The virgin will rejoice in the dance, the young men and the old together, for I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them joy in their sorrows. I will fill their soul of the priests with abundance, and my people will be satisfied with goodness. Think God wants us to be celebrant people. When we say I'm too tired to spend time with my spouse, man, I'm too tired to... Spend time with my kids. I'm too tired to spend time with God. Isaiah chapter 40, starting at verse 28, says, Do you not know, have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary. And to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, oh, those who wait on the Lord will gain new strength. They shall mount up with eagles, like eagles, with wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary, and they will walk and not faint. I don't know about you, but I need the strength of the Lord. Because when I'm weak in Nehemiah chapter 8, God says, God's word says, Then he said to them, Go, eat the fat, drink the wine, and send portions to him who has nothing prepared. For this day is holy to our, our Lord. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is what? Your strength. Balloons belong in church. Balloons belong in your home, in your marriage. Life should be a celebration. When we say, man, God must be really angry with me. God says, you know what? I love you. Christ paid for all your sins. You can read Isaiah 12 later. Isaiah 55, 1 says, hope. That means stop in cowboy talk. No, <laughs> but no, really in cowboy talk, instead of hope, it would be, guess what it would be? Yeehaw. Yeehaw! Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Jesus said in John seven thirty seven. Now on the last day of the great feast, Jesus stood up and cried, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. You see, the idea is this. God created us to be filled with joy, to be filled with peace, to be strengthened by him. You're not alone in this journey called life, and you're not alone in the struggles that you go through in your marriage or at work or whatever it is. When you run to the Lord, he will fight for you. Pastor Chris did a homily not too long ago. And the whole sum of it was this. Man, stand by and watch because God will fight for you when you're his kids. If you're parents, you know how you would protect your kids. You would lay down your life for your kids. You know what? As Christians, we're God's kids. And he loves you more than you could ever imagine. Romans chapter 8, verse 37 
It says, but in all things, we are overwhelmingly more than conquerors through him or loved this, who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. When you say, I have no peace, Christ says, I'll give you peace. If you want to experience true life this morning, the lie is that God doesn't love you. The lie is that there is no God. The truth is, God loves you more than you could ever fathom. And he desires to have a relationship with you and to work in your life and to fill you with strength and peace. He desires to heal your marriage. Marriage should be a celebration of life. And life is all about getting to know God, enjoying his creation, and enjoying your family and friends. It's not what you own, who you are, where you work, the number of stripes on your shirt. It's not anything else. Life is about knowing God, loving your family. True life begins when you know God. And we should guard our marriages. Today, God, to sum it up and to end it, wants you to really trust him. To really believe that he's real. He wants to restore your marriage. He wants to know you and bless you. God loves you this morning. And the question is, will you follow Jesus Christ from this moment on? Some of you say, man, I'm a Christian. I go to church. Are you really? Do you trust God? Do you know that Jesus paid on the cross for all your sins? The simple promise in John 3, 16 is for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. The simple gospel is you can't be good enough to earn God's love. The simple gospel in a marriage, Chris, you can't be good enough to earn Saul's love. She can't be good enough to earn your love. Guess what? You just give it. You freely. And God is love. So he loves you this morning just the way you are. Christ paid for the sins on the cross. Will you follow Jesus Christ from this moment forward? Do you believe that Jesus paid for all your sins on the cross? And that when you believe in him, you are forgiven. Only then will you find true peace. And only then will life become a true celebration. Because you'll have that fruit that comes from the Lord. And the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God's design for marriage. I started with this verse. We'll end with it. Ecclesiastes 9. Oh, my children, God says, go then eat your bread in happiness. Drink your wine with a cheerful heart, for God has already approved your works. Let your clothes be white all the time, and let not oil be lacking from your head. Enjoy life with your spouse, whom you love, all the days of your life, and it is fleeting, which he has given you under the sun, for this is the reward of your toil. And in this is why you've labored under the sun. Would you bow with me really quick? You know, maybe you're here and you really don't have that relationship with God. Oh, sure, you believe, but like many, you think he's not concerned about your life. He's not concerned about your marriage. Well, I want to tell you this. The Bible is all about a God who is concerned about everything. In fact, it says he knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows everything about you and yet loves you. You can't earn God's love. In fact, how we get relationship with God is simply believing in Jesus Christ. The Bible says he came to reconcile us to God the Father. He died on the cross for all your sins. He loves you so much this morning. He wants more for you than you can even imagine. And he wants you to have a life filled with celebration and joy and peace that only comes from him. This morning, if you've never really surrendered your heart to Jesus Christ and you want to do so, if you just look up at 
up at me. I'll be praying for you. And God sees your heart. He knows where you're at. Maybe you've fallen away from the Lord. Maybe you feel distant and far from God, like He doesn't hear your prayers. I can assure you in Revelation chapter 3, Jesus was crying out to the church, to Christians, and He said, Behold, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock. Ah, if you would just open your door to your heart, I'll come in and have sweet fellowship with you and you with me. This morning, just in your seat, as your eyes are bowed, heads bowed and your eyes are closed, I would encourage you, open the door of your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. Just say, Lord, man, I know there's more to life than the struggles I've been trying to do in my own strength. Lord, I don't want to battle anymore. I, I, I don't want to be filled with anxiety. I, Lord, I need, I need the strength that comes from you. I need you to fill me with the good fruit of your Holy Spirit. Lord, I need you. Father God, I pray that everyone in this room and those watching online, I I pray, God, that you would gently draw us to you. Lord, I pray that when we bow our knees in prayer that we would really feel your presence. Lord, I pray that for all your kids, all those that receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. God, I pray that you would bless them, that you would bless their marriages, that you would fill them with real love. God, I pray that you would heal marriages this morning. And as we get ready to witness the restating of vows between our beloved pastor and chaplain Chris and his bride soul, Lord, I pray that all of us who are married here would renew our vows in our hearts. We love you, Lord. We thank you for this beautiful day. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to take a five-minute break. Uh, If you need to go to the bathroom, uh, stand up, stretch, Uh, arm wrestle with somebody. I don't know. (laughs) You can do that, and then we'll be uh, doing the ceremony. God bless you. Thank you.